so you can watch it later. Oh, I can go live on YouTube as well. Very good. Uh, wonderful, although it's opening Internet Explorer. Who uses Internet Explorer anyways? Uh, all right, so, so let's get started. Uh, welcome to 377, the Modern Physics Lab course. And I'm glad that you are able to to join this course. So this is a brave class. And before I start, I want to know who of you have taken modern physics before. So you can write in the chat, yes or no. So I will have an idea. Okay, yes, yes, I have three yays. Uh, let me see, it's three, four, five. Okay, so I get five replies. So most of you haven't taken modern physics. So the idea of this course is, is the, to give you a hands-on experience in the modern physics the modern physics course and for you to have an idea of working with setups that resemble a, a lab, uh, the environment of a lab. So this will be a very hands-on course and we will be doing, doing, working with your hands. So I'm really glad that you are able to join the course in this semester. So we have many challenges this semester and I should start by going over the new protocols set up by CUNY. So when you come to the campus there are a few protocols that you should follow and let me write, let me open here the file. So I sent you the Queen's College Fall 2020 guidance that you see shortly on your screen. So if I share my screen here. Um, all right, so let me share this screen. All right, so you see now the Queen's College Fall 2020 guidance, and there are many, many regulations and protocols that should follow when you come to campus. So I highlighted a few few parts in this document and we'll go over it. So any presence on campus is voluntary. So that means that you are not obliged to attend this class in person. So if you feel that you're sick or have come into contact with someone who is showing symptoms of COVID-19, uh, please don't come, just send me an, e an email. I'm setting up the stream in the lab. So we will be able to interact online as well. So I have a set of three cameras. Two of those are not, uh, one, one, one is not working right now, it's just a, some configurations, but you also be able to see the camera you're seeing now and also the camera to the board right there. So when I write and I'm explaining the theory, you can also follow from there. And you can, and then we can interact. So you can talk to me or you can talk to one of your colleagues if you're doing experiment. So you can do the experiment virtually. Also, let me zoom in here because this might be small, so depending on the size of your screen. So all QC members must obtain approval to be on campus. So that includes me, that includes you. So we should be approved to be on campus and, and you should download an app that I'll explain later, Everbridge. So each day you come on campus, 
you should download this, you should fill up this a form in this app, the Everbridge app. And then there you, there are a few questions, yes or no. Uh, are you experiencing any symptoms related to COVID-19? So you answer yes or no. And after these questions, you get an approval or a rejection to come to campus. So each day you should obtain an approval to be on campus. Uh, by the way, if you have any questions, you can just ask in the chat. You can also unmute your microphone or your video screen if you, if you want to. And you can ask as well. You can interrupt me, interrupt me at any time. So, okay, so Renita Ann, she will join in a second. Um, and she will be here somewhere. Okay, so, okay, I'm glad that you joined because uh, she came to campus today. I think she missed the email I sent to everyone. And I realized that your email, it's probably not the email is that's in CUNY first. So your email is in CUNY first something like uh, flyingpastaman at gmail.com. So I found it strange that was that email and I was concerned, but I'm happy that it worked out. Um, okay. Everyone working on campus must adhere to the New York State Higher Education Research Guidelines, must show, must show the QP or CUNY identification in, the, in front of the main gate. It is required to have face covering on campus if engaging with others in close proximity. So there are a few things here to talk about. So when you come to campus and you are allowed to come only in the day you are taking the class, so you are only allowed on Fridays to come to campus, you must show your ID and there, depending on, they are changing the system, but right now you have to fill up the form, the safety or health attestation form, and someone will measure your temperature with one of these forehead detectors that I have in hand. And then you're good to come to campus. So I also have a forehead detector that I'd be using to monitor my temperature. So if my temperature is higher than 37.5 degrees Celsius, you can make this conversion to Fahrenheit. So if someone can help me to make this conversion, I would appreciate right now uh, and tell me how much is 37.5 degrees Celsius. I write here in the chat uh, how to make this conversion. So right here. Um, it's changed when you, okay, so I don't have access to the chat, but I do. It's at 37.5 degrees Celsius in Fahrenheit. Ninety-nine point five. Great, thanks, Christopher. So if your temperature is higher than 99.5 Fahrenheit, uh, you are not allowed to come to campus. And you also have here, so you can monitor your temperature. I will not be measuring your temperature, but I recommend you for the safety of your colleagues for you to measure your own temperature. So if it's higher than 99.5 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, please leave. In front of the campus, actually, they measure, they don't know how to measure, unfortunately, because the, the, the thermometer is calibrated for the forehead, and our head, the temperature in our head is higher than the temperature in the rest of the body. So the thermometers are calibrated to measure in the forehead. So I just came to campus today, and the security guard measured in the hands. So that's not a reliable system, unfortunately. Uh, we have to deal with that, but we have here a uh, thermometer. And you should wear the face mask when engaging with others in close proximity. I actually 
wear it all the time when I'm on campus, except sometimes when I'm in my office. Uh, right now I'm not wearing because I'm speaking to you uh, online, but when I'm teaching the class, I'll be wearing the face mask. Um, so I use all the, all the time because sometimes someone can come in close proximity to you and you don't know how to react. But you can, you know, you can, if you're experiencing problems, breathing, you can just go to isolated place and remove your safe masks. And also during the class, if you, if you want a break, you just can go outside, outside of the building and you can, you can get some uh, newer. So there is another question from a green spirit. So will the main entrance to be the only available entrance into campus? So that's a very good question. Thank you for asking. Uh, yes, unfortunately, it's the only main entrance, which is pretty bad because I, I also take public transportation. So I take the Q64 and I use it to go to the to enter through the side gate, the science building. So unfortunately, we have to go to, to the main entrance and do the checks there. All right, any, any other questions? All right, good. So to obtain permission to come to campus, QC members must request access first using the CUNY Ever Bridge app. So please install this app on your phone. It was a bit slow in my phone, so it, it took me a while to download from Google Store, Google Apps App Store. But then you, it, it's very simple. Just put the name of your institution there. Uh, the instructions are in, in this college uh, website. You can download clicking this link, and then you can go to this website. This website is not ready yet. I don't know when this will be ready. So right now, we are filling the forms in the entrance of the campus. So if this website is not ready, I expect that you, you may experience some delays coming to campus. So I recommend that you come earlier, earlier than the class start so that um, the lines will not make you come late for this class. So when you arrive to campus, you have your temperature taken via touchless thermometer and be provided with a device to connect this mandatory registration system if you do not have one, if you do not have a smartphone. They will not be recording this, this temperature, they will just, just be measuring. QC members with campus access are to only use the buildings they have received authorization to enter. That means you can only come to the science building. You can also go to the library on appointments as well. Uh, there are, by the way, there are two open campus spaces, the science building cafe and the library cafe where you can you can eat. So we have food on campus in these two places. Anyone who has symptoms, fever, cough, difficult breathing, body aches, chills, or a new onset of extreme loss of sense of smell or taste must stay home. As I told you. Anyone who has been on campus and believe they have been exposed to COVID-19 must fill out this form. So the, the college will be monitoring and trace tracking the, uh, if there are cases here, because if there is a case, they will close the building, the disinfection. So they are keeping our safety uh, very seriously. So it's the top priority. And they are doing hard work, I must say, I must admit. And luckily, you know, we are able to, to host this class. Many of the CUNY campus, campuses are not, uh, will not be able to join, uh, to, to host in-person classes, but I'm happy that we will. 
faculty and staff are encouraging to compress work. So faculty will not provide any in-person advising. So I will not be providing in-person advising, so you cannot come to my office at any time. You cannot come to my lab, unfortunately. But I will be available online. You can send me an email and I will reply as soon as possible. All QC members on campus are expected to cover the nose and mouth with a face cover. So when you use the face, face mask, you should cover both nose and mouth. And I'll be checking that, make sure that you're covering both. No face mask here, no face mask in the, eye, in the eyes, front of the eyes. So nose and mouth. And we will be providing, at least in this lab, we'll be providing face, face masks. So in this lab, we will have to wear face masks and gloves as well. So we have a few over there, we have a few uh, PPE. So we have gloves, face masks, so we must use both. And you also have hand sanitizers in our lab. There's also hand sanitizers in the building but when you come to class, you have to use your hand sanitizers or hand sanitizer. And, um, and then wear the gloves. And if you touch your face with your, with, your, with your hands using the gloves, you have to replace the gloves as well. So you have also to properly you are expected to properly store and when necessary, discard PPE. Also adhere to physical distancing instructions. So uh, try to be six feet apart. Report symptoms of exposure uh, of, or exposure to COVID-19 using the form. Follow hand hy hygiene and cleaning and disinfection guidelines. Follow appropriate respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette. All right, so let's see what else we got. Okay, so when two or more individuals are in a space at the same time, they must target use of workstations, lab benches, or other areas so that individuals are at least six feet apart in all directions, side by side, so when face one another. When distance is not visible between workstation areas, everyone is required to wear face cover. So that will happen in, in our lab. Uh, because sometimes you will not be able to, to be six feet apart. So you must wear the personal protective equipment at all times. Everyone is encouraged to use stairs rather than elevators whenever possible. And, you know, it's just three floors. So if you don't have any disability, please do some exercise and use the stairs. So they are the market for moving up or down in the building out of the limits to limit cross traffic. Uh, cross traffic. So what they did here in the science building, they put signs and you are in some stairs you can go only go in one direction. I'm not sure if that will work. Uh, I, you know, I really believe that will not work, but our stairs are pretty wide, so you'll not come into contact and avoid staying the stairs, never stay there. So just go to your floor and that's it. The elevator occupancy is limited to one or two occupants at, at a time, depending by size in the market with floor decals. When two people ride the elevator at the same time, both must wear face coverings. So we have markings in the elevator. So in our elevator size building, only two people can be at the same time and you have to stand in the position there. Everyone is, okay, you are in New York, so this should be obvious to you. When you're walking here in the building, 
everyone is directed to walk on the right side of the hallway, thereby limiting interaction with those moving in the opposite direction. So also commuting to campus. So for those traveling to campus by public transportation are encouraged to drive at off-peak times, wear nose and mouth covering masks while, while traveling, and to wash hands for at least 20 seconds with soap and warm water or use sanitizer upon arrival. I actually do both. And if you go to our restroom, you see that um, there are many limitations. There are only one person will be allowed at a time. And the people waiting in line, they should be six feet apart. So they put on the floor a sign. So you should stand in that area. The shuttle bus will run Monday to Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And of course, you have to use the PPE and only one passenger is allowed per bench. Everyone on campus is required to wear a face covering if engage, engage with other people in close proximity. So Queens College will provide masks and wear pro appropriate gloves. All right, so that's it. Any question? Okay, so, okay, so there is one. Uh, we have to bring gloves, so they are provided. Okay, we, they are provided. Can we get a link? Ah, okay, so Adrian, so you did not receive my email. So please write down here in the chat your new email or an email that works. So I can send it to you, but I can, I can probably send this file. Okay, thank you. So, um, file. So I come to the location. It's 277. I have more files here, so I will share uh, the three files. So this is the the guidance. In order, ah, let me sh show to everyone in the meeting. Okay. So here's the guidance. Here is our syllabus, and here is today's class. Oh, it's all going to you. Okay, again, so the guidance, sorry about that. The class description to everyone, great. And the guide counter, set up. great. All right, so there are no more questions, so I can, I can discuss the syllabus. So let me share the screen again. Share screen, let's share Google Chrome. All right. So, all right, so this is our syllabus. Let me zoom in so you see, you see it better. Um, as I told you, I'm not available for office hours, only online communication. So you perform, perform several experiments in the second in the second page. I divided the four into four groups. So these are the titles of the experiments, and they cover different areas. So today we will talk about the Geiger counter. So it covers uh, radioactivity, nuclear physics. Uh, we also cover nanotechnology. So you we'll build an atomic force microscope. So a group will start building a, an AFM next week. And I will send you the I will send you the manuals so you can read the theory in advance. And you assemble this setup. There is an experiment in 
spectroscopy, hydrogen spectroscopy. So we will reveal the Bohr model, the atomic model. There is an experiment in optical electronics in light emitting diodes. There's also experiment in semiconductors, a transistors experiment. We have an NMRs, nuclear magnetic resonance experiment as well. And later on, we will build a microcentrometer. This this group one we will build a microcentrometer. Uh, so, as you see, it's really hands-on. So, at least two set two setups you will build from scratch. And I will send you the manuals, and I will uh, I will provide you guidance along the way. And so that is a recommended textbook, although I'll be providing materials. So this is just recommended. Um, if you have, if you want to understand a little bit about the theory, you can find it in this book. Although you know, I will be providing the materials with the theory. So this is just a, a recommended, there are no, there is no required textbook. So our schedule in science building three for three. And so the final grade. So the final grade will be based on the attendance of the classes. Uh, of course, we are not required to be here, but at least you are required to, to tell me in advance and watch the online lecture. completeness of experiments and the reports in the format of a scientific article. So there are two experiments, the microcentrometer and the atomic force microscope, where you build a lab report in a format of a scientific article. That means title, abstract, introduction, uh, results and discussion, conclusions and references. So I'll send you a, a template later. And then we have a talk at the end of the course. So I will select a few papers. So I select at least I'll select at least one paper for you in a subject related to modern physics, an experimental paper, and we will give a talk at the end of the course. So usually by October, I give I give you the paper and you give the talk. In the, lab, in the final class. So the lab reports will be due two weeks after the experiment is completed and points will be detected for lateness. Uh, this is a bit, this is more flexible. I can, you can, you can send the report two weeks after or three weeks after the experiment is completed. So there's flexibility there. So as you saw before, we divided into, in four, into four groups. And there are seven people attending this class. Let me see if everyone is here. So right now I have one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So someone is missing this class. Ah, okay. No, that's the entire class. The other person is taking on Tuesday. Uh, all right, so there are six people in groups of four. That means that at least two groups there are, there will be two people working in the same in the same station. And with that, you must be careful when using the PPE when working. In this uh, when working in the group. And you know, this is divided in such a way that once your group is selected, you carry this person or you work with this person, sorry. Carry, I mean, just if you don't like this person, it's like a burden, but you work with this person. So if you prefer to work in groups, in a group of two, please tell me 
he sent me a message. Oh, I prefer to work in groups, in a group of two, or I prefer to work alone. Because, you know, there are some advantages and disadvantages of working alone in a group. Many experiments are very, very hard to, to perform. In particular, these two, the AFM and the microcentacarometer. So it's nice to work with someone and exchange ideas. But if you feel that you, you, you want, or if you want to work, work alone, just let me know. Uh, you can reply privately to the chart, uh, in the chat. Okay, so, all right. So uh, there was a question, a question by Christopher. Do we choose a scientific article or is it given? Usually it's given, but if you want to, to choose your, your article, you can do it. Please send me the article and I will take a look at it and I'll say, oh, maybe I may say, okay, that's a great article. I can say, oh, maybe you should uh, select another article. I'll give, give you another article all right so so if you want to work alone in the group so i can make a poll here but you can answer privately if you want so let me send to everyone in group or alone so what do you prefer so i can have an idea uh, how many and I can arrange the groups. Okay, great. So there is one group, there is one group, there is one group. So, okay. And someone has to, at least two people have to work alone. And I'm sorry about that. Okay, group, group, group. Okay, uh, it seems everyone works, wants to work in groups. But someone will work alone. At least two people will work alone. Uh, you may volunteer. If you work alone, I will be here anyway. So you'll be working with me. Uh, okay. So someone volunteered to work alone. Uh, we can, you know, you'll be working with me as well. So, uh, you know, so, okay. So two people can work alone. Okay. Um, so if you feel comfortable working with experiments, so, and you can work alone, so, you can work alone. And if you cannot come to the class, that means I will, I will do the experiment with you online. You'll find out a way to use either my smartphone or you set up in the workstation, the camera, so we can work together as well. All right, I think I covered everything I wanted in the, in the syllabus. Any further questions? All right, so no more questions. Um, so let's stop. I'm sorry if you uh, said this earlier, I guess I may have missed it, but you mentioned early to campus um, to beat the traffic. I was wondering if you know how early we're allowed to go, like what time it opens, or if they let you come, like for your class, or you have to like stick to your time slot. Uh, well, I have no idea because this is the first time they are doing it, so I honestly don't have any idea. I I would arrive at least half an hour, at least in the first day, just in case. Um, I think it's a better idea that I let you know because I'm come I'm coming to campus most of the days and next week at least we'll, some people will be taking classes so I can have an idea how long the lines will be but you know this is my guess that there will be lines because they are from the way they are working I see they are being slow but it could be that it could be quickly no, maybe it's quick, it will be quickly. So I don't know. Uh, okay. By the way, I have a question to ask all, all of you. Uh, how is the sound 
uh, how is the sound of this of this lecture? So you can answer in the chat. Good, bad, outstanding. Please let me know. Okay, good, good. Okay, so it's okay. Okay, so it's okay. It's not good. So I will take a look at it. Uh, uh, because I set up a new microphone system here, and I hope that it will work. All right, so um, if you don't have any more questions, so we can actually start the class. So I will share the screen again. Can I ask one more question? Sure. Um, will you assign us groups sometime before next class so that we know what experiment will be on? Yeah, sure. So actually, I have to set up to, to show you again the screen. So, okay, so, so you have group one, two, three, and four. So the first class is the Geiger counter. In the Geiger counter, you'll be doing the experiment next week along with these other experiments as well so today i'll explain the theory but we'll be doing the, the experiment it will be quickly because you have the much i've seen the materials and i pre-recorded some videos videos so you'll be doing also the Geiger counter so next class, we will we'll talk about, you know, one group will work with the FM, group one, and group two will do the same experiment, two, three, and four. We will do the same experiment, the transistors. So if you're selected to the atomic force microscope, you'll be doing the atomic force microscope. And actually, you will not be doing the Geiger counter. I, I prefer that you do in October because this is a short time. Three weeks is very short. So I prefer that this, at least this group will be group one. We'll be working only on the FM and then complete the Geiger counter in October. So that will be a long time afterwards. But as we are sharing or sharing equipment here, so I have to divide. And the only way we can fit the FM is if you start in if you start next week working with the FM. So the group that will work with the FM, we will already know which experiment we do. Uh, by the way, we can have, you know, if you want to volunteer, if someone wants to volunteer working with the AFM, but, you know, I recommend that someone with experimental uh, experience, so experiment, some experimental skills. So please write in the chat here. Right, so write in the chat. So I'm waiting for volunteers right now. So this, in my opinion, is actually the most interesting experiment. We don't have any volunteers yet, so I might select. Because if I have a volunteer now, we, at least we know which group will be working. OK, so no volunteers. So I will ask another question. Did you see my, um, my message in the chat? Oh, okay, so your message is in the chat. All right, so that means that I will, I don't have this chat here. Okay, good. So I stopped it share, sharing this thing. Okay, I got AFM training. Very good, Hans, but never used one myself. If you think I should go, I can. Okay, so if you think that you should go, you can. So you'll be working with the AFM next week. That means you already know your 
the experiments we'll be doing, this, this sequence. So I will ask another question here to the group. Experimental experience. Do you have experimental experience? So please answer yes or no, because then I can select the second group that we work with the upper first microscope. So I can select group two. Okay, no answers yet. I think people are delaying. Okay, just physics two, three, four, some. Okay, William Costa volunteered to be in group two. Okay, so both of you will be working alone, right? So that means, okay, so Leia will be in group one, William in group two. Okay, so, so we, we already divided the groups. At least group one in group two. And, and then I'll have time to define who will be in group three or four. As you see right there, let's let me share, share this screen again. Okay, group. All right, so this will be Leia, this will be uh, William, and then I can select group three and group four, and I, I can pair you up. If you want to work with someone, I, I will let you do it. So if you want to work with someone, ah, yeah. So we'll be working in pairs. Group three and four will be working in pairs. So if you want to work with someone, let me know, then you, you can work with this person. All right, so uh, more questions? All right, so I think we can start the Daggett counter class. And I sent you this uh, the theory of the Geiger counter setup. Okay, there's a chat here. I will work with Chris in group three. Okay, so we're already defining the groups. So we have group one, two, three, and four defined. All right, so very good. We just have to remember this. So I'm not sure if this will be here. Save, so I will copy and paste, just in case. All right, so, uh, okay, so you're seeing what I'm doing now. So I'm saving right here. All right. Okay, so I sent you this, the guy encounter lab. Some of you received already by email. So here is divided in two parts. One is simple statistic analysis, where we'll be you know, doing you know, simple analysis, calculating the mean value, median value. As we have Excel here, we can do this in Excel. And let's, let me see, there's another question. Does anyone want to be partner with me? Um, the second person, so you don't have to, so that would be Renita, um, because that's the only person left. Uh, okay, so, so in this set, in this, in this lab, you, you calculate the mean value, median value of this table, you do later, and you do, you can do in Excel, if you don't have Excel, you can do it on other software. And in the labs, we have Excel. So you can work there. Another question. And okay, so after, after the class, or after we finish the experimental part of my, in the theory explanation, we, you can find here the background on the Geiger counter. So you can follow these during the class. 
and also when you're doing the experiment. So there are a few uh, questions here and you can follow all these, all these lines here. Uh, anyways, I think I can get started with the, with the class and radioactivity with the value counter. So I can stop sharing this thing and let go to the web camera. All right, so I think this is working now. All right, so, so today we'll talk about the nuclear radioactivity and how to measure it. And the particles we'll be investigating today or talking about are alpha particles. So these are ionizing. Ionizing. Radiation. So alpha particles are particles that energetic particles that are actually a uh, helium atom where the electrons are removed. So that, that means you have two protons here. In, let me draw it another color that you can see from there. And I might be blocking sometimes here. And here, two neutrons. And the, as the, electron, the, electron are, the electrons are removed, so this is positively charged. So this is a heavy particle. So, so this is heavy. And you can block this particle using just a piece of paper. So you can block with paper. We don't have this uh, one element that emits alpha particles, it's polonium. Okay. I have to check in my notes because I'm not sure if it's two or one or two ten. Uh, we always yeah, two ten. So, so polonium to ten and meet up of the particles, and then you can block them with a paper. The second particle, and at least this particle we will be measuring, is the beta particles. Which is a highly energetic electron. Traveling, highly energetic electron. So this traveling electron, negatively charged, can be blocked by a piece of aluminum. Block by aluminum. So paper doesn't block, but aluminum blocks. And I will try to do a demonstration here. I have a hand guide counter, a very old one, and we will try to check if this is true. And the other particle that we will be measuring, so an element that emit, emits beta particles is cesium-137. And cesium-137 also emits a different particle called the gamma. Uh, 
particles. And gamma particles are, in fact, electromagnetic, electromagnetic radiation. So it's not, it's a massless particle with a high frequency, high energy, high photo energy. Which also means high frequency. High frequency. In, and these particles can be blocked by in, by yeah. as a, you cannot block 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 with aluminum. You cannot block with paper. Only by lead. So this is a quite dangerous particle. Because it can cause cause cancer, it has a high frequency, high high photo energy. And what I mean by high frequency, so if you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, so so if you look at the electromagnetic spectrum. On the right hand side, you have long radio waves. So, radio, wave, uh, radio waves, AM and FM, they are, the wavelength is quite long. So, it's there on the order, at least FM is on the order of meters, and AM is on the order of hundreds of meters. So, here in the bottom, we have the wavelength in the top, you have the frequency. Then, when you increase the frequency or decrease the wavelength, you enter into the microwave region, the one that you have, the ones that your cell phone uses to communicate. And let me just. After that, you come into the infrared regime. So here includes part of the terahertz and also part of the of the, the thermal radiation. So the radiation that you you see, for example, with these thermal cameras that you can monitor the temperature of people, falls in this range. After that, you get into the visible spectrum, the one that your eyes can detect. From That goes from red to blue when you decrease the wavelength or increases the frequency. Then UV, ultraviolet light, X-rays, and gamma rays are right here at the end of this spectrum. So the wavelength is quite small. It's on the order of 10 to minus 40 meters. That means this is a, this could be, you know, the frequency is very high and, and it's a very dangerous particle. And 10 to the minus 14 is actually on the side, on the order of the size of a proton or electron. All right, so we can, we can do a simple experiment. Uh, after, after I talk, after this introduction. So let me see if I can get a better angle with this camera. So if I change to this camera here, uh, very good. All right, so, so this is not the best angle. So I will bring something here for you. Oh, great. 
So at least this appears there. So in my hand here, I have a set of uh, radiative uh, par particles that I will show you later. And I have also this Geiger counter. So it's a very old Geiger counter and it emits a sound. So if I turn on here, and if I bring it close to my radioactive particles here, I'll probably hear uh, radiation being emitted by these particles. This radiation, by the way, is safe. It's very safe. We are allowed to, to use it here. So don't be concerned about this radiation. And I will select, let's see, I will select this to the beta particles and the gamma particles. So we have strontium, strontium 90 emits beta particles. I will put it right here, facing up. I will put, let me select about 60. So we are working here with strontium. See there. Strontium 90 emits beta particles. And then we have cobalt 60 which is emitting gamma particles, and we have cobalt. So let's go. And then we have, let me select another one, cesium-137. All right, so. Cesium-137 emits both gamma and beta. So I put in this order here. Strontium from the from my left to the right, and I hope this is right. Here. Good. From the left to the right, so strontium, beta particles, cobalt, gamma, and cesium. So this should be blocked. These strontium particles on the left side should be blocked by aluminum. So let me see if I can go there. Mm. All right, so it's emitting beta particles. Good, so I will try to block with a piece of paper first to check if it works. So, I try to block with the paper, it doesn't work. And if I try to block with this piece of aluminum, let's see if it works. At least I hope it works. And I will not look like a fool. So to see that the number of counts has decreased by blocking with this piece of aluminum here. All right. So indeed, we can block the beta particles with aluminum. The second particle is cobalt that emits gamma particles. So let's try here a piece of paper. I'm blocking here. Doesn't work. A piece of paper. And aluminum doesn't work, doesn't block. And lead, I will bring some lead for you. All right, great. Here I have lead. And let's try to, to block. Oh, my lead doesn't block. Which is very important to know. 
and this is not thick enough. So you see that is very hard to block this particle. I have a very heavy piece of brick uh, made out of lead that I can I can try to to make this even thicker with this brick. So let me bring in a minute. All right, so I have this heavy piece of lead, of lead. It weighs like 20 pounds. And let's see if this works. Let me put on the top here. And this should block. Oh, and not even the. Ah, okay, good. Now it's blocked. So I was just saying. Professor, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, so didn't you just say that the gamma particles are dangerous? Are they not in whatever you're using? Um, let me switch here. Screen. So your question is, did I say that gamma particles are blocked by lead? No, didn't, didn't you say that they're dangerous? Yes, they are very dangerous because they can cause cancer, but this level of radiation is safe. Oh, okay. So it's just a very small amount. That's why. Yeah, yeah, it's very small amount. It's safe, as you see in the label later. So it's safe to. to okay, cool. Um, can I ask you another question? Sure. Um, so are we going to be handling lead? You'll be handling these particles. They are safe. This, they are for educational purposes. And they are very okay. So they're like covered, or are there any safety measures for that? Um, no, because they are for educational purposes. So the level of radiation is very small. Oh no, no, I meant handling the lead. We're handling it, right? For handling? Uh, no, no, because the levels are small, so you can handle. Just don't eat them. Don't uh, don't work walk with these around 24 hours in your pocket, but the, the levels are very safe. This is orders of magnitude safer than what you see, for example, in nuclear reactors, radiation in a nuclear reactor. But what we're using, using to, um, to block it, the lead? Yeah, I mean, the, the lead, I, you know, we just have this lead to block, and this brick is actually not to, um, this, is a, this was for another experiment that we used in the past uh, for to block uh, cosmic rays in, in a neutrino, uh, not neutrino, but an electron positron annihilation experiment. So this is not made for, for uh, uh, nuclear radioactivity experiment or Geiger counter experiment, should I say. Uh, any more questions? Okay, so no more questions. Let me take this out of the side. Ah, all right. Ah, I did it. I forgot the final one. So the final one was cesium 137. So cesium 137 emits beta and gamma particles. And so we can block gamma particles by a piece of aluminum. Oh, sorry. We can block the beta particles by a piece of aluminum, and, but we cannot block the gamma particles. So if I measure, right, so I have the radiation there. If I measure here, it will not work. It will block at least the beta particles but we want to block the gamma particles. Uh, so actually, I should change the screen. All right, so you see again, I'm counting the C here, one to seven, and if I block here, it will not block completely, because it's only blocking the beta, but not 
blocking gamma particles. Uh, anyways, after this simple demonstration, we can continue our talk. I'm not going to do this first time, so we must. All right, so any questions about demonstration and, and the types of particles that call ionizing radiation? They are all dangerous in a certain point, not this examples we are using, but high levels, high doses of radiation are dangerous. But Gamma, because they are all ionizing, but gamma, they are more dangerous in a sense that you really need lead to block or very dense material to block. So it's hard to shelter when these particles are emitted. So there are several famous accidents with these particles, season one to seven. So there was a famous accident in, in Brazil, the country where I come from, where a hospital, uh, a hospital was using season one to seven, and then simply uh, throw away the material, the radioactive material that they use using for radiotherapy. The, discarded on the regular waste. And the material had a cover, you know, with a, a steel, steel cover. And some people saw that and they took because they are working on it. They wanted to recycle the steel. And so they found in their regular waste and they opened that and let me open that. And then he saw a glowing blue particle or blue material there that would glow in the in the dark. So he was very excited. Oh, such a beautiful material. And he even sold to people. And these people got sick, they got cancer, and many people, well, dozens of people. By, by exposure of season one to seven. And you know, there are many more recent cases, including, including one in Seattle recently. So they are all dangerous, but this is harder to block. Yeah. All right, any more questions? Okay, so the material you see is uh, the samples you will re receive. We are okay. So these are the samples you will see. There are many. There are a set of few, five samples. We have gamma, beta and gamma and beta and also alpha but alpha has polonium 217 has decayed already it has a very short lifetime and yeah so this is a um, very small quantity so we don't need to worry about it this is the publication date and so here we have the elements let me i can highlight here So here is the element. So here is the element, in this case, Tallinn tool for. Let me open this even a zoom here. So let me go to the next slide. Okay. 
Great. So I give a zoom, I have a zoom in the area. So we have right here the enemy calling to work for. And here I have the level of radiation. So this is the level or the decay rate. And the decay rate is in units of Curie, named after French scientist Marie Curie, who won two Nobel Prizes in both physics and chemistry. And one Curie. It's equivalent to 3.7 times 10 to the 10 seconds to minus one. So this is the decay rate. So 10 to the 10 particles per second. So the level here is six orders of magnitude smaller than one could. So right here we have the Yeah. which is the time it takes for the for the decay rate to fall to fall to one half also if you have here uh, decay rate on this axis so decay rate I really prefer the board. And here we have time. So the decay should be exponential function. It should be something like that. So if this is rate one, R1, and this is R2 here. So the decay rate is this time here. Let's call it time. So this part is where fabricated in December, at least a December was fabricated in December 2003, a long time ago. And Okay, I think we were all born. I was worried that I was getting very old, but at least I think you we were all born in 2003. That means that you know, the radio, the decay rate now is much smaller. So you can calculate that. And yet we actually will measure this with your, with our value counter. And the type of radiation. Or the part that you can use. Uh, wonderful. In the device we just use it to, to measure the the rad radiation is the, the so-called Geiger counter. So So the guy counter has 
as a Geiger Miller tube. So it's a tube we took with, let's say, a capacitor to place one. It's called the pathway. And one is called the other. And there is a gas in the inside. So this is closed. So it's closed. On one side, there is a window here. So let me use another column. There's a window. Where the particles can come to this side. Where the ionizing radiation can come to this side. And here's the side the, the tube, the diagonal tube, you have a gas, a polyatomic gas. And you apply a high voltage between the cathode and the ionic. So there's a circuit here, I don't know. The circuit here, and the left circuit, and, and here you apply a voltage. So that's plus here and minus, and you apply high voltage. In high, by, by high voltage, I mean on the order of hundreds of volts, or even almost 1,000 volts. With this, you charge these fields. There is a very high voltage between the two plates. In the case of the guiding counter we are using, it's, this is actually a cylindrical. So we actually have two cylinders, one side, the other. But this is the simplest scheme. So, so there is a very strong, there is a strong electric field inside the gas. And they are highly ionizable. So a particle can travel here, let's say a beta particle, a highly energetic electron can travel here, and the electron can collide with an atom. So let me draw here outside. We have an electron negatively charged particle colliding with the atom. So so this is the nucleus, we have several electrons around, and there is a collision. This highly energetic electron will collide with the particle and you lose energy, so it's an inelastic collision. Inelastic collision. And after it collides with the atom, it will the atom will emit another particle, emit another electron. So we end up with two electrons. So let's say E1 and E2. So the electron ionizes the atom. And this there is a high voltage between these plates, these two electrons here. So there. now there was a collision, and two electrons were emitted. So the original electron will travel towards the anode, and the second electron emitted will also travel towards the anode. These two electrons can also collide with more atoms in the system. And after a collision, 
you can also ionize an additional electron. So uh, here in the additional electron and also this one and also ionize. So have okay. one electron here and another electron there. Professor, I have a question. Yes. Uh, why are two electrons emitted? Okay, so actually, this is the original electron. So this is the original electron. And, and then this is the second electron. Well, you know, I say they need this in a sense that once the electron is colliding with the atom, it's also part of the atom. It's a thing quantum mechanical, but it's the original electron. And the electron that was released by the atom is E2. All right? Did I answer your question? Uh, no. Okay. I'm so confused. So, you, uh, uh, uh a beta particle goes through the, the gas. Yes. Yeah. And it hits a, an atom. So does the original beta particle bounce off the atom? Yeah, it bounces off. So uh, it, is, is another electron, is another beta particle emitted? So uh, yeah, it's another electron emitted. It's not a beta particle now. I would not call it beta particle. I would call it an electron because the beta particle has a high energy. Okay. So it's traveling with a very high speed. The electron that is emitted by the, the atom has a lower speed. There's a conservation of momentum in the system. Okay. So the electron can lose momentum. It's going to start losing momentum. So the beta, I would not call it a beta particle because it, it will have a higher energy. So it's not necessarily a beta particle. It's just okay. an electron. All right, got it. All right. Good. So, and this keeps going. So this electron will collide again. And you need and the atom will release more electrons, a pair of electrons. And this process continues until it reaches the, the anode. So there is a multiplication here. This is called an avalanche process, and it's called also. So the electrons will reach the the cathode via this process, the calcium calcium avalanche, and the current will establish the electrons will move to this potential here, and, and you can pick up the current. So the current is in another way, by convention, right? So the current is established this way. That means that the electrons are the other way, and then you can pick up the signal in the circle. So this appears as a pulse in time. So if this is the voltage in your circle, as a function of time, this will appear as a pulse. And then you can detect a single, can you detect a single particle. Professor, what did you say was on your uh, y-axis? Uh, it's the voltage in the circle, so. Okay. So this is the signal we are measuring in the circle. As a function of time. So it appears as a pulse. 
Okay, thanks. Okay, any more questions? You can also ask in the chat. Uh, let me see what the number of other questions in the chat. All right, so, so that device, that old device that I showed you, uh, uses this thing. And of course, one of the drawbacks of this of this device is that there is no no spectral sensitivity for information. Let me write here: no spectral information. Which means that you cannot know which particle is being detected. So there is no way to know whether it's a gamma, beta, or alpha particle. Because uh, it's a single device, and you are just ionizing there, and there is no steam to, to, to detect the energy of the, of the particle. You can use simulators or not talk about things to know the energy, to measure the energy of the particles, and to know whether it's gamma, beta, or, or alpha. All right, so one of the uh, one of the characteristics of this bag counter is the so-called the plateau. So may I raise this part? Uh, let's see. Uh, at least yes or no. If someone has any objection or any further questions, please say no. Okay, there's no no. Uh, so I'm gonna raise this part. Anyways, everything is being recorded, so you can watch it later. All right, so you get something called the counts, which is the number of events. Number of events. So each particle will trigger a signal. So the noise you hear from the, or the sound you hear from our value counter, it's one count. Each noise is one count. And this guy count is actually, it has a sound, you know, a speaker there, because then you can know if there is a radiation and you can leave the area. But you will be measuring counts. And the counts depend on the voltage you are applying. So remember we to say that we are applying a high voltage. So if you go from zero to, let's say, 1200, the signal will be zero, when the voltage is zero, and you see something like that. It will be zero, stay at zero, the number of counts, until a certain number, which I don't know by heart, but let's say it's something like 600 volts on, on, on this order. And then you start seeing, observing counts on your detector that increases with the voltage. And there is a region, uh, maybe I show you what the bigger is for. Let's put in 600. And then this will increase until there is a region where the voltage doesn't increase 
So I mean, the number of pumps doesn't increase when you increase the voltage. And this is called the factor region. So in your measurements, you should measure at the platform, which is around 900 volts. So there is an experiment to, to measure the platform, and you will be doing this experiment next week. Uh, all right, so I, I, I can actually show show you the Geiger counter. Now, I actually, um, I'll show it later. There's something I want to talk about the we talk about the season, atoms. So one of the factors we've been measuring is the season. And if you remember, I told you that season one to seven it means gamma and beta pump. So electromagnetic radiation and a highly energetic electron. So the process. I wrote down here. So we have the energy here, the energy level of cesium on the side. So this is cesium here on the And it actually has, it has 55 protons. And this is the atomic mass. So you can sort of track the atomic mass. Minus the protons to get the number of units. This part could be case spontaneous. So this is a spontaneous and random process. So you cannot predict exactly when it will happen. And it depends into a barium. So it's barium. And it decays as. And actually, this happens by a decay of the neutron. Decays into an electron. And a proton. So the, the neutron, a neutron in the barium, a neutron from the cesium particle will decay into an electron in the proton. That means that the atomic number will increase by one, you have another proton, and another element will be from the barium element. In this decay here, you will need the gamma, the beta particles, with an energy of 0 0.51 mega electron volts. 0.51 mega electron volts. And it happens that it has actually two paths. So it can go this way, or it can go in another way. Another direction. So it can decay also in a beaker, in a barium particle, the same. But with lower energy. So this is another state of the barium atom. This is a lower energy state. So this is called a metal stable. State. We put a little end here that survives for a short period of time. So it's a hundred of seconds. So the element, the barium element, stays there 
for hundreds of hundreds of cells. But this is the most stable. Okay. And when in this decay, it also emits beta particles with a higher energy. What I should look here, which is 1.17 mega electron volts. So there are two paths, and 95% of the time, the cesium atom decays into the barium atom. Via these uh, to the metastable stable state of the environment. And that means 5% decays into a stable state. And in this metastable stable state, the barium atom in the cave emitting a gamma. Radiation, and which is a hot. So I will draw this really very nice. So this is a hot. And you can calculate the energy by subtracting this minus this, and then you can get the energy, which is six point six six two mega electron. So this is the energy of the of the beta of the gamma socket emitted by, by the barium, the metastable state of one to seven. And if you measure this with the guy that like I will show you in one second. So I recorded. I pre recorded in a, a video in my YouTube channel that I created for you. So I'll try to find it here. There we go. All right, so I will share this video. Let me increase the resolution. And there is a way to share the a better resolution. So give me one second. I can click here, share screen. Then I can go in advance. Okay. You can show the version of the screen, optimize video share, and share. All right, so I need to increase these. Okay, so we actually part with this messing up with me. I'm going to share the entire screen, but importantly, it's not allowing me to. I will select the entire screen, that's the case. And then I can go to YouTube. And I hope you see this video. Do um, you see the video, by the way? I, I ask a question to the chat. Oh, my internet connection is All right, so here's the Geiger counter setup that you'll find on your workstation. So this is the counter. Uh, there is a high voltage coming out here, so never touch this area, but it's relatively safe. Uh, we have the controller, and now to open the software, we open the STX X64. Okay, so this is the software, it's quite intuitive. Uh, you can select, for example, the voltage, we'll try to set Mm, set high voltage and let's see 950 here we have this set of samples so we have five samples and 
each sample uh, emits a certain radioactive particle. So, for example, let me pick up cesium-137 that emits beta and gamma particles. And right here we have these two sample holders that we insert somewhere here. This sample holder fits well, so I'll put here. And you know, sometimes people ask where to put it. I prefer to put in the first one because then I get more counts. If I put in another place here, I'll get fewer counts because the, the sample emits in uh, po radioactive particles in all directions, like it's a sphere. So if you are far away from the, your detector, you get fewer counts. So, so you can preset, for example, you can preset the time. Uh, let, me, let me put 10 seconds here. And we can also preset the number of runs. After 30, 31 runs, it will stop. So I select 10. And let's start here. So in order to start measuring, you start here. So the sample is relatively radioactive. If I remove the sample from the, from the front of the detector, the, the number of counts now it's very low. If I move away, it will be even lower. And you still get some background because you are detecting uh, cosmic rays that excite the detector. And I can put it down here. You see that I get fewer counts. The rate is smaller. And if I put closer to the detector, I have a higher rate. Okay, so the first experiment you do is a plateau experiment. In all measurements you, you will perform, they should be done in the plateau. So you can select right here, experiments, plateau, and here you can input your parameters. So for example, you can start from 400 volts, and you can end at 1,000 volts. Never exceed this voltage. And the step voltage can be 20 volts. And you can select, for example, 20 seconds for each time. And if you check this box, you can see the results, and then you can run. So here, I'll click the existing data. Okay, I don't want to save anything. Okay, so now it's running. Experiments is counting the time here. You can see the total number of counts here. And this will take a while. But all your experiments should be done at the plateau. So you determine the plateau in this experiment. In the meanwhile, we also have here a certain set of samples. So here we have, this is strontium, so this is a sample you use when you try to measure the dead time of the detector, and I will explain how later on. All right, so this is take a while, we will be back soon. So were you able to see the video, by the way? Because I'm, this is the first time I'm sharing the video. Yes or no? Um, yes, great. Okay. Was the quality good? Good quality. Good quality. You can also watch on the YouTube channel. Pretty good. Okay, so. So Zoom is not letting us down. Um, I just noticed that, let me go to the other. Oh, 
I just noticed that when I was explaining the system, I said the sample emits radioactive particles. And that's wrong. It doesn't emit radioactive particles. It emits ionizing particles. So you have a radioactive element. Element which is cesium one to seven because the, the, the decay happens in the nucleus and the particle itself is ionizing part, so it was a mistake. I apologize, I probably made this, this mistake a few, few times here in this lecture. Uh, now I can, we can go to the results. We have, so we can go to the results. Let me share another video. Okay. Okay, let's. Uh, version of the screen check. Good. Oh. Okay, so we just finished our measurement, and you can see that there is a threshold around seven seven hundred sixty volts where you can start seeing counts, and then the the signal grows. On the number of counts grows until it gets to this plateau region. So any measurement here in between 900 and 1000 volts is within the plateau region. So it's relatively safe to measure in this region right here. So you can, you can copy your data. So for example, you can edit, copy, and then later on, you can open in Excel. So let's come here, Excel, copy, Control V. <laughs> then you can plot your graph, so you can select the numbers, the two columns, and then you can insert, let's insert scatter, and then we can plot the graph in Excel, and later on you can do the data analysis. So I can stop sharing this screen. Right. All right, any questions? Right. Good. Now, I'm not, okay, how long does it take for the experiment to run? Okay, it takes, depends on the time you select to, for the number of counts. So you select a given time. You can see on your in your notes on the lab that I sent to you. So it takes 20 seconds per run. It should take less than five minutes for each experiment to run the plateau experiment. All right, so another Another measurement that we will be performing is the, the dead time of the, the test. So I also have another video to share with you. Of measuring the dead time, of estimating the dead time of the, of the Geiger counter. Uh, start sharing right now. So one of the practical considerations that you should take into account when working with Geiger counters is the so-called dead 
time in which you cannot make any measurement, cannot detect one particle, and that happens after you measure the first particle. So if you look at the signal in your detector as a function of time, so you measure the first particle, you get a pulse, and there is a time window here where you cannot detect a second particle. So here there is no detection. And then you can measure a second particle here, and then you can measure more particles, and the signal grows. So in this time here, the signal is fully recovered. And you can measure the dead time from here. From peak to peak, you can estimate tau here, oh, sorry, tau, the dead time. So you see. So, uh, by the way, uh, I forgot to mention the, the, the dead time is actually the time that the detector needs to recover from the first, from the detection of the first pulse. So the gas is ionized and, and it needs to be ionized. And also there is the RC time of the detector. So this takes, so this is called the dead time. You see how we can do this using our oscilloscope. So let's go there. So we use oscilloscope right now. Okay, so we have a cable here, an output cable that you can connect to your oscilloscope. And right now I don't see any counts. So let me increase the voltage in the detector so I can select, for example, can come here, setup, HV settings, and we have to work within the plateau region. So let's say 900 volts. Okay. Uh, the sample is there. I can, let me increase the time here. So I can increase it, let's say, to 100 seconds. So I can, I can see the number of counts here in the controller. So, okay, now it's running. Um, so, so now I see something here. And I can see that the signal is inverted and I see many pulses. So the first thing I would do is invert these because I prefer to work with the signal up. And I can move this down. So I will see it better. Okay, I, let me change the time division here so I get fewer pulses in the screen. Uh, let me adjust the trigger. And this is a random event, so it's hard to get the trigger and position in one point. So ideally, we should, if the number of counts was very high, I could do a single shot measurement. So I could stop, you know, run and stop, and I could see several peaks here. But the number of counts, or the rate, the radio, uh, radioactive rate is very low so I cannot see more than one pulse. So there is a trick to do it in some oscilloscopes. We can, we can accumulate signals in the screen. So let's see how we can do this. Let me run, because I want to accumulate these pulses. So if I display here, there is this option. So if I click display here, there is an option to accumulate. And then I can see many pulses. So let me change the time window, because then it will be even easier to see. So you can see that the first pulse, there is an uncertainty here, because this is a random event. So the trigger is not working well. But there is a time here where you don't see any count. And here you see more counts. So what I will do, I will stop this. And I will take the average position here. So this is a rough estimate. 
So if I stop here, I can try to measure the distance here between this region here and this region. So we can find our cursors right here and you can select our source. Let's select channel one because we're connected in channel one and let's select vertical. So this is the time cursor. So if I select here, where I have this full bar and this, da this dashed bar, Okay, so my video just canceled there and it stopped it there for some reason, but you'll be you were able to see many pulses. Um, and the way you can measure, and by the way, I noticed that oscilloscope has something wrong there. It inverted horizontal with vertical. But the way you measure your you end up with those mini pulses. We have the first pulse, then the middle pulse is blurred, and then you have many, many pulses. Maybe have something like so in oscillos in oscilloscope there is a option that will select the poster and you can so you can come with a bar so there is a vertical bar that you can move around so you can move this bar around and you can measure the the time Moving this far, so you can set like what? So this is ISP. You can select and you can come to these that you change the color. So you can try to find the, the average here. And the first thing here. Also, there is a second bar. So, bar one and bar and vertical bar two. And you can move both, and, and you can select which one you want to move. In the oscilloscope, we show this delta t, the time between these two bars, and this is the end. Right, so any more questions? All right, no, no questions. I actually have a question for you. Are you familiar with oscilloscope? With oscilloscope. Yes or no? Okay, one person. Yes, no, no. Just, just virtual ones. Yes. Okay. So it's quite, it's quite straight. Um, all right. So if you're not familiar with the oscilloscope, it's relatively intuitive. After, after you learn it, you can work with one oscilloscope or from one brand or from another brand. But my idea is that you touch things, so you have to touch. But of course, always touch with gloves here in this place. So you'll be able to rewatch the video and pause because I went very fast there. Uh, which buttons I, I was touching. But the idea is the same for whichever oscilloscope you use. Whatever oscilloscope you use. Uh, 
All right, we also compared these results on the dead time using the oscilloscope with that two, two source method. So in this two source method, we measure, we have a source that we break, we broke into two. And you measure one side of the source, one half of the source, and you write down the rate. You measure the second right, the second uh, half of the source separately. One of the, the second rate, and you measure them together. So the idea behind is that when you measure them together, you have fewer counts because of the dead time of the dead. So you annotate these three values, one half, the second half, and, and the whole part, and you use the formula that's provided in your notes. All right, any more questions? Okay, no more questions. Anyway, so I have another question now for you is do you have Excel on your computer? Or do you have access to Excel? Or to any floppy software? Yep, 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 yes, yes. All right, all right, all of you. Okay, so now we can start the first part of our of our lab, the data analysis part. So by now you all have the the lab that the file, the PDF file I sent to you. And then you can start plotting a high server. So let me try. So you do it yourself. And I can also do here myself. But you do it yourself. So you can start reading part one. And I will try to set this up here as well to work with you. But you're supposed to do this mostly alone. So you can open your file and then you can copy and paste the data, these numbers you have, and you can do the data analysis in Excel. I myself, I'm not very familiar with Excel because I use, I use different softwares. So it's always, it always takes me a while to plot it. Usually I'm able to do it. Yeah, I realize that I'm not able to copy from Word to Excel so easily. So I will need the original Word file. So, so we could give me five minutes and I will take a break and then we'll be back and I will be back with the Word file. So, right, see you soon. Oh, by the way, you can also use this time to take a break yourselves. So we can be back in 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes.
Excuse me, Professor? Yes, I can hear you. Can you, um, get in the room? I believe she's waiting. Oh, yeah, she yeah, there are many that. people waiting in the uh, waiting room. Uh, let me change here. So, have me. We haven't started yet. Give you another five minutes. I might leave the room as well. There was something I forgot to mention when you come to the lab. Avoid bringing external objects. Please come as light as possible to, to the lab because many people bring backpacks and a lot of stuff. So avoid bringing, avoid bringing your laptop, avoid bringing the backpacks. So come as light as possible. Uh, because we have our computers, you can always export to your, your Google Drive. And we want to avoid contamination, phosphorus contamination, if the, the objects are not disinfected. You can bring your cell phone, but clean them. Clean your phone. So use the, you can use either the disinfection solution we have, or you can use a nice, if you don't want to use the solution, we can use a UV device, ultraviolet device that I have, where you can just place your cell phone there, and, and after five minutes, uh, it will disinfect your device by applying UV light. Uh, we also have disinfectants in the room to clean the your stations. So you clean all the time. So when you after you use it, I'll try to clean it. And I will also clean as well. Just in case. And also before we start the class, uh, let's clean everything as well to be safe. Yeah, so I'll copy the files so here. I think I have access to the, the word file now, and I can send it to you. Okay, so you received the word file, so I think you can copy the data. Let me try this one. Do you mind sharing your Excel window, Professor? No, I don't mind. I'm just not working on it yet. And we work. We can work together. I'm not working on that. At least I will try to copy. That would take me a while to separate. This is the phone. Okay. 
I could do a big conference. I think I have two bunch of copies in one column only. See what they do. I believe I'll have to copy it in one column to do the statistics. The statistical analysis. So that is an option to build a high satellite. And it's actually an extension that we should install. We have installed on our computers, at least for the older version of Excel. If not, we can go there. For this version. So you can calculate the mean, the, the mode, this one, with the analysis. The new version, you can do it the older version. But that should be Googled. If you know how to do it, you can also share the mm. yeah, state analysis too. I'm not sure if I have here. So you can let me know in the chat and if you want to share with your colleagues. Just install this computer. Sorry, Professor. I think Leia is still trying to rejoin the room. Oh, really? Yes, I, I, I oh, think okay. it says she's in the waiting room. Okay, so. Oh, I'm sorry about that. She's still waiting. You know, it appeared here and I guess yes. It shows joining, but it's take a while to. Yeah, yeah I, I don't find participants, so I don't think she's in. Yeah, there. it shows me it's joining. Show, but she's not joining, she's not able to join. And it doesn't seem to be from my side. I'll ask as any options. Maybe, we'll maybe maybe she should log uh, leave Zoom and come back. We start Zoom. Sure.
Okay, I told her to close Zoom and try and see if it works. Okay, let me see if she joined the room. Oh, not yet. Uh, she said Zoom was not responding on her laptop, so it might take a minute. I told her to let me know when she's back okay, in the room. Okay, I think or... she, she might be able to watch the meeting. Am I live on YouTube? Are you live on YouTube? Am I? I don't know. I think I... I oh. Uh, I think I said, yeah, okay, live on YouTube. I oh, know it's open to no, I have to set up before you know. Yeah, maybe Zoom is having a problem with Let me pass another thing here, another, another way.
Right, so I think I found it a way to do it. Yeah, found it. Okay, good. You might have found it for me. Not let me show my screen here. Okay. We can try. All right, so I copied the data. I mean, there is a place where you can change um, general to number. So at least Excel knows that I'm working with numbers. And then you can select your formulas. And right here, you have more functions than you have statistics. So you can calculate, for example, the average, which is the mean. That's number two. So you can come here, average, and then you can select the values. I copied and paste everything here. I'm not sure if, if it works if I do this. No, I think it works. 200, 16. I'm not sure. Let me test selecting these values here. And I copied from here to here in one column. Functions, statistics, average. If I select here, I press OK. Oh, yeah, it works. Great. So you can also select the median, statistics, mode, median. And by the way, this most serve belong to the former structure of this course as a great idea. Yeah, so I think she probably is lost, is lost somewhere. And I also also my camera is in the direction. I try to do that.
All right, she is back. Great, welcome back. Thanks, I had to restart my laptop. Everything just shut down on me. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Oh, no worries, thank you. On my side. No. No. But in the meantime, I lost access to my camera. So I think I have access to only another way to see me, it's probably And you might see the other camera. Again, I'm not in real time. I believe. There is a second delay. I think this is slower. So what we're, do we're doing, we're showing how to use the Excel function. So you probably see my screen now. Yes, you see my screen. And we're using the using Excel to calculate the mean value, the median value, the value that where half of the of the values appear on are larger than that value and half of but it's smaller than value. It's a more meaningful statistical function. So it's the statistical, statistical function that makes more sense in some cases. So for example, if I am, for example, Jeff Bezos enter into the same elevator, you can say that the our average net worth is around a hundred billion dollars. Or if Jeff Bezos and me and our, we go to the same elevator. But the mean value should be much less than that. And that uh, and the median value. And that's what makes more sense. Are there there are some questions where you have to use the radioactive data from your from your results. And that we will do next week. Because the the decay, the radioactive decay follows the Poisson, the Poisson distribution. Which describes random events that are discrete, discrete and uncorrelated. So, for example, the number of goals in a soccer match, in soccer matches, in a tournament, they are uncorrelated, discrete, and random. We cannot predict. So that happens to be to be. The radioactive decay. And then you can make more measurements and with a larger number of occurrences. Then you can check later if you can get a Poisson distribution. Okay, now I have a question for you. If everyone is able to to join, I mean, to, to be in Excel. At least first question. So first question in Excel.
the video and back. It's easier than a phone. So no answer, so I assume you are not able to, to calculate the average, the medium. The mean value, the median, and the mode. And the mode is the number that occurs the most. This was, that was question two. For question one, we, we can should make a history. Okay, so we can calculate the smallest number so I can know where the histogram will be in. And where it ends, maybe it's the largest number, that's very large, that's large. So I can select this array. And the largest number. So it's the largest number, it's the first. So it's too good, too good. Okay. So at least I know the limits of my discernment. So to write the beam, so let's see. Yeah. It's one. So I will start with two oh eight. So let's see. Two oh eight will be in the center. I can say like two oh eight minus one point five. Should be two six. Five and then two six point five plus three. That's two point three nine five. And then six plus three, three, two, five. And I can select these. And if I select these, it appears across there. If I drag these, it will also complete. Okay, so then I constructed the beam. Okay, the other question is how to how to write the this element. So analysis of the 
Professor, what function are you looking for? This sub -realm. Did you find it? Uh, sorry, I, your mic cut out. What did you say? Histogram. Oh, the histogram? Yeah, the histogram, yes. Um, go to uh, insert. And over, uh, I think you have it ready. And then there's the one that looks like a bar chart, and I believe it should have an option. Uh, cancel on that one on the arts next to that. Ah, we lost. Sorry, hold on. Um, if I think if you go over to uh, there's the section charts over to your left a little, ah, okay. and then there's the bars in the middle, ah, and right, then great. it should give you an option. Ah, okay, great. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, so the B side is very. Very large. Here. So we should, we should Do you start. control click it? Yeah, so this is the chart range. Okay. So if you right click on the on the data. Um not on that that like actually in the chart itself. Um Sorry. and select data. Uh actually, sorry a second. I just did this on my end. Um it's, you go to actually I think hold on one second. I don't know which series this is. If I stop it, series. Oh, okay, great. Do you have um if you right click, can you see it says format data series anywhere? If you click into your chart. Um Actually, on the chart itself is where I usually do it. If I right click in the, if I um, click on format data series, and then if you go to series options and do horizontal, yeah. it should give you bin. Great, thank you. Oh, great. Okay, because the previous version, you need to select the bin here, and then it will do for you with this bin. So this is the one yeah, you the have. New, the newer the, version has changed it. Yeah, the newer version. So we can select the bin here, and we probably get the the new chart here. Right? So we can select one. All right, thank you. That's working. And you can, you know, when you do the measurement, you will you have more numbers. You need to do automatically. So you can just copy from the software, from the guy of the software to the histogram. And you can you can do the beam. All right, so now it's actually easier than using the previous version. I think the computer here will have the previous version anyways. That will take some time. 
in in for in for the the nuclear activity you should get the Poisson distribution so once you do it you get a graph that looks like the Poisson distribution which is skewed and then you can compare that with the, some theoretical results what you expect from a, a Poisson distribution or a Gaussian one all right, any more questions regarding either the class, next class, or okay, what are you looking for? Uh, if you are able to, so I was asking people if, were, if they were able to plot a histogram. The next slide. Did everyone get it? Yes or no? Okay, no. So which version are you using? Because then you could change them. Not really. Okay, 2010. Right, so it's probably this version, right? I don't see. Use it to be easier. So now my question is, do you have the same question as I? That's my version. So, yeah, Professor, your version is newer. Ah, my version is new. So it's not 2010. No, 2010 is an earlier version. Ah, all um, right. So in the 2010, that would be, there is, it's another, it's another way to measure. It's the one we have in our computers. If, if in the 2010 version, um, the options are probably similar, but you're going to have, I don't know where you can find a bar chart. So Christopher, if you can find where you do a bar chart, you'll probably be able to adjust the bin size um, and the histogram. All right, so maybe, maybe Christopher, can you, so Christopher is not getting, right? So. Can you share your screen and maybe you can do from there? I mean, only the Excel file. So there is an option that you can click share screen and then you can select only the Excel of your several screens and then you can select this Excel. Ah, it says post disabled screen, screen share. Right. So now it's my fault. So let me enable here. Let's try the participants. Good. One participant can share it. Can you share now? Great. 
All right, so this is our older version, right? So at least, okay, we do the Instagram. So you can go to Insta. Okay, so there are many plots. So let's see other charts. Yeah, and there, yeah, okay, so. Okay, it doesn't appear there. There's a Instagram. So this has all, all charts, right? If we go to stock, right? No, I should have yes, this one. Do you remember how to do it? Uh, that was William, right? He was talking to me. He was talking to me before. Okay, give me one second. I'm going to the other lab. Um, Chris, try a 2D column, uh, and then right click it, select, and then highlight all of the uh, data on the left side, see if it comes up. And I don't know if you want it as one series though. Can you um, click cancel? And can you can you format the can you cut each row B C D E F and add it to A to make it one column? And now do the same select data, but this time just click A. And click OK. I think that should. OK, at least in the series. Uh, right click it. Format chart area. And Click through those options, maybe go to size. I don't know if that's uh, properties. All right, there's no width here.
there is there is an option in data it's a physical that you have to at least I, I have to install it so if you if you close this window so on the menu on the software menu you see data there the form data it's the form window now right to the right it's data yes data so yeah you should be there there is you don't have on your software but there is an option right there that should appear as, as data analysis and i remember that you have to enable that in in excel thing so so for those who have excel thing let's see data analysis analysis module on cell 2010 so okay so where is the data analysis about any okay okay i mean okay so click the file tab so it's this website maybe i, should, I can show okay click the add-ins and the yeah, exactly this one and now it's a stool tab yes this one i think it's this one yeah that's okay i think it can press okay Not yet, right? Once the data the admin has been successfully installed, you'll see the data analysis when you click the data box. Okay, let, so let's do it again. Maybe I should share my screen. So in this, in this website, you have these instructions. Go to the chat here. So this link has instructions. So you have to choose to install the data pack because it's the analysis tool pack. It's very important. Okay, I will show this video. For those who are not playing. This tutorial will show you how to get Excel Data Analysis Tool, which can greatly expand the functionality of Excel. Start Excel and click on the File button in the top left corner of the screen. This will present you with a menu, and you need to click on Options. The Excel Options window will then load. In this window, you need to navigate to the Add-ins option in the left-hand menu. This will provide you with a list of all the available add-ins for Excel. At the bottom, there is a button called Go. Click on this. This will open the Add-ins window. This window will give you several checkbox options. You need to click in the checkbox next to the Analysis Toolpack option, then click OK. That is essentially how to get an Excel data analysis tool, and to access it, you need to navigate to the Data tab, and you will see a new box called Analysis, and within it, the Data Analysis option. Okay, 
Okay. Now, can you share your screen, Christopher? Okay, so you figure it out. All right, so we, so are you able to plot, plot the histogram? Then, so maybe you, you have the same version as when you have and mass. Okay, office this is fine. Okay, so oh, so that should work. Good. All right, any more questions? Okay, no more questions. I think we can. Well, we can end the class here. No, just remind me at least Leo, Leo, remind me to to send you the AFM manual so you can follow the you can read the theory before coming to the class. And the rest of you will be working with the transistor transistors experiment. So I will re pre record a lecture, the theoretical part, and we can, and you can work on that after you work with the bag account. So you can start working with the transistors. So the idea is to, to reduce the time you spend here. All right, more questions? If no more questions, so uh, it was a pleasure. Okay. Professor, when this lab is due? All right, so my answer will be a very dangerous because you don't need to, to give me a lab for this, for this experiment. But I hope you work on the, on the statistics problems because we will be doing next class anyways. All right, so it was a pleasure holding these these online only lecture. So I will see you next week. And we will need, of course, you need authorization to come. So you need to go to the website to the, install the Ever Bridge app to come here, and you can come only the, the days you are taking in person classes. And, you know, it was not as smooth as I wanted the online because I have to do both at the same time. But I will see you next week. All right? Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye bye.